So let's begin our discussion uh, by trying to define what life actually is. We know that life is exceedingly rare in our corner of the universe, but uh, on Earth, life is ubiquitous. There are life forms that live in the Earth's crust down to many hundreds of meters, bacteria. There are complex ecosystems in the depths of the oceans, and in every ecosystem on Earth, from, from the depths of the oceans to the highest mountaintops, and including the Arctic regions, life is known to exist. So, although not all biologists would agree uh, on a common definition of what life is, for example, some would argue that viruses are not life, there are some common features that we can all agree on that define life. So living organisms are composed of cells. So life on Earth as we today is, is cellularly based, meaning um, the <coughs> membranes separate the internal cellular environment from an external cellular environment. It might not always have been true. The earliest life forms may have been replicating molecules, but today life on Earth is cell cellularly based. And even viruses depend upon cells for their replication. They're dependent upon cells. Life forms are complex, and you only need to look through a microscope or simply walk out in a mountain meadow to see the complexity uh, that life exhibits. And the key feature of life is that it is very ordered. Life is ordered matter, ordered in ways that inorganic, non-living materials simply aren't. And we'll, we'll be discussing that order as we go through the semester. We know that life organisms, living organisms, respond to their environment. Um, and they, they do so in a variety of ways. And that will be a, a part of our, one of our topics for the semester. We know that living organisms can grow and they can reproduce. Now, growth doesn't always mean grow in size. It can simply mean that the number of cells might increase. Um, and reproduction is absolutely key to defining life because without reproduction, life uh, would not evolve, evolve. And when we talk about reproduction in life forms, we talk about reproduction um, that is heritable, that whereas traits are heritable from one generation to the next. And that is key to evolution as we will see. So that's a, growth and reproduction are other characteristics of life forms. We know that life forms obtain energy and they use that energy. And in fact, part of this course will be spent discussing the flow of energy through the biosphere, from the sun, through uh, organisms and ecosystems. We will spend some time on that. We know that living organisms maintain an internal balance. That is, if you were to sample the chemical composition intracellularly inside a cell and compare that to the chemical composition outside the cell, they would be different in very particular ways, in ways that in fact define the biochemistry of cells and um, define life in essence. And of course, living organisms allow, allow for evolutionary adaptation, and this is the key features. Their reproduction allows um, the features of life to change over time in response to environment or other factors. So evolution is a characteristic of life. And if we look at uh, the three major domains of living forms on Earth, this is what we see. We have the bacteria, we have the archaea, and we have the eukaryotes, to which we belong. The eukaryotes I have pro the protists in them, single-celled uh, eukaryotes. The animals, the fungi, and the plants are all eukaryotic organisms. And we'll discuss the features of eukaryotic organisms shortly, but for right now, eukaryotic organisms have subcellular compartments defined in them. Uh, the nucleus, for example, or the uh, mitochondria. The archaea are used to be thought of as bacteria, but are now recognized as a separate domain of life. And uh, the archaea are single-celled organisms with no major compartmentalization uh, like the eukaryotes. And then bacteria are prokaryotic as well. The archaea and bacteria are prokaryotes, and the prokaryotes um, are single-celled organisms that are, do not have internal partitions in them. And if we talk about kind of the, or, the organization of, of matter that is life, 
we can move from uh, through a hierarchy of organization of matter. So organisms are made of matter and, and matter consists of atoms. And those atoms are assembled into molecules. And then those molecules in life forms are found, are often found in macromolecular form. That is life has very long, large molecules that we call macromolecules that are large assemblages of much simpler molecules, much like building up a complex structure from single Lego building blocks can construct Legoland, for example. We know that there are organelles. An organelle is a, is a, a next a level of organization that we find in eukaryotes. For example, here is a mitochondrial, images of mitochondria. This is an electron micrograph, and this is an um, artist's rendering of, of a mitochondrion. And those organelles are then found at a higher level in cellular life. Cells are then organized into tissues in multicellular organisms, at least. And those tissues are further organized into organs. So, so we see a, a sequential buildup in the hierarchy of the orderedness of matter in living organisms. And we can move in then from organis organs to entire organ systems, like the nervous system that would be found in a vertebrate, for example, or an inver invertebrate for that matter. And then those organ systems finally are assembled into an organism like this Canada goose here. Moving further up the hierarchy, moving from the organismal level to the populational level, we then see that organisms are found in populations, and those populations are often defined species or members of, um, of the same group of organisms that can breed and produce fertile offspring. Species are often parts of communities, which consist of a number of species living together, and communities can be assembled then into ecosystems, which are much larger assemblages. For example, this mountain ecosystem here would have a community that existed in the mountain stream, uh, might exist on the um, steep slopes of a, a, a community that might exist on the steep slopes of the mountains, and there might be communities that exist at the highest levels. And these communities could actually be different from each other, but together they would then form an ecosystem. And finally, all the ecosystems on Earth together define the biosphere. Now, before getting into the specific topics that will constitute the material of this course, let's talk about what the nature of science is, because this is a science class and we're going to use the methods of science to discuss uh, genes and development. So, so we can say that science really is trying to understand the natural world through observations and through reasonings. Usually, scientific questions start with observations and much of science, therefore, is descriptive, but a large part of science moves beyond description to experiments. And experiments, as we will see, are used to test ideas, test hypotheses, and to eventually build up theories. And we can f formalize this by saying that science uses two types of reasoning, deductive reasoning and inductive reasoning. So let's talk about inductive and deductive reasoning. Deductive reasoning is using general principles to make specific predictions, whereas inductive reasoning uses specific observations to develop general conclusions. So we can draw that here. We can, we can have a schematic here which allows us to define this. So we move from, in deductive reasoning, we are moving from general down to specific, whereas induct, uh, inductive reasoning moves from specific observations to more general theories. So in this part of the, the right part of this schematic here, we might have theories that would consist of a number of hypotheses that have been, have, have reason to um, be formulated. And then these hypotheses can be tested with experiments. So this process of testing hypotheses or testing theories by experimentation is deduction. We go from the general to the specific. Whereas moving from observations that might be obtained by experiments 
or might just be observed, might be by, um, might arise from observations in nature. Uh, scientists develop theories to, or hypotheses to explain their observations that are found in either experiments or um, other observations. So that constitutes induction. The left part of the schematic is induction. And we have moving from specific observations to more general ideas, theories. That is the, the differences, the main differences between um, inductive reasoning and deduction re deductive reasoning in science. And this process underlies all of science, and it characterizes science as a unique way of knowing about the world. Given that theories lie at the apex of our inductive and deductive reasoning process in science, then it's worth considering what exactly a scientific theory is. In the sciences, a theory is a particular framework used to describe and understand the world around us. Such a framework is only recognized as a theory after a firm empirical basis for its body of knowledge has been established. This is done through such things as extensive and long-term experimentation and observation. Yikes, what the heck does that mean? Well, well, what that means, as our guest has succinctly pointed out, is that a scientific theory is something quite different than the, the way that theory is used in the everyday vernacular. A scientific theory, as opposed to, oh, I have a theory that there are Martians living on Mars. A scientific theory is based on a body of interconnected concepts, and in fact is a body of interconnected concepts. And these concepts which are encompassed by a large umbrella of a theory, are supported. These concepts are supported by lar a large fundament of evidence, empirical evidence, usually derived from experimentation, and deductive reasoning, which tests a number of hypotheses that are parts of theories. Now, hypotheses can become theories if they are te thoroughly tested um, but usually hypotheses, the word hypothesis is used to designate a um, smaller idea, a smaller idea about how something works. Whereas a scientific theory is, usually encompasses a large number of concepts, each of which might be, might be supported by the testing of various hypotheses. And we can then say that a theory is an expression of idea of which we are most certain. So we are fairly certain based on um, theoretical work um, and by empirical work that mass warps space. This is, comes out of Einstein's theories of relativities. And we are fairly certain of those uh, ideas. They've been tested in a, in a number of ways. Now that's not to say that those ideas, that theory could be overthrown, that, I theory, that those theories could be wrong, and we're always open to that in science. However, for ideas to acquire the status of a theory in science, those ideas um, have to have been tested and supported by, large, uh, by a large fundament of evidence. And therefore, when we refer to something as a theory in science, it's possible that it, it could be wrong and overthrown, but usually it is um, established and will remain a part of our um, body of knowledge in science. So let's see how that would work in a practical sense. So in, a, in this simple schematic, let's take an example of inductive and deductive reasoning. Let's say we have an observation, the sky is blue. That could lead to a question, why is the sky blue? That can, could then, through a process of deductive reasoning and experimentation, lead to the development of a hypothesis and the elimination of competing hypotheses where that hypothesis makes certain predictions that can be further tested by a variety of empirical studies a variety of experiments that could then lead to a decision whether or not predictions made by that hypothesis are confirmed or not and if they are confirmed the hypothesis would gain strength and could become part of a theory now let's examine Darwin's theory as an example of inductive and deductive reasoning. 